This morning, I, I, I believe uh, I had the Lord go in one direction for a message uh, at the beginning of the week. And uh, how many of you heard a preacher say, you know, well, the Lord woke me up at 3 o'clock last night. Well, he didn't do that. But he did the night before, and it, and it shift, shifted gear. So he gave me a one-night, a one-night, one-day uh, heads up. But I believe, more importantly, it's what the Lord, and hopefully I don't fumble through it. I've wrote a bunch of stuff down, but I believe that the Lord wants to convey to us this morning on the topic of the grace of God. And let me tell you something. We sing about the amazing grace. And sometimes we really don't know how amazing the grace is. We don't grasp how amazing God's grace is. Or sometimes we take it for granted of how good God's grace is. So why teach on grace? Just look around us right now. And it, we'll be heading somewhere with this, but how many people don't know the grace of God and maybe they don't even understand the grace of God? We come and go each Sunday morning. And you got enough of the church lingo, and you get enough of the the uh, the the, ch the church ease, the talk, the the language of church. But we really don't just stop and and understand and grasp and 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 attain the grace of God. How many believers even live today with a sense of shame and condem condemnation because of past mistakes or failures? And for some believers. We, we, we don't get a hold of the grace of God, and so we become very performance-driven. Um, we, we think we've got to do, do, do to get the grace of God when that has nothing to do with grace and, the, and His grace that He offers freely. Whether it be a father wound or discouragement or depression because you thought you've never measured up, there are many people, even Christians, that even experience and live in rejection because of wrong decisions or, or failures. But today, I want to bring us good news of what grace is. First, I want to try to bring clarity of, of what grace is and then what grace does. So grace is, but also grace does. There was a young man who went into a religion class at college, and he raised his hand, and the professor called him in and asked, what's your question? And the young man said, what makes Christianity so special? Why do you think that it's unique? Why is it, what makes it different from all the rest? And the, young, the professor replied to the young man, it can all be summed up in one word, and that one word is grace. The professor continued and said that every other religion, every other religion is based on and predicated on what you can do for God, little g, their gods, or, or th their high being or whatever. But Christianity is predicated on what God has done for man. He's given grace. It's not about what we can do. It's about what he's already done. 2 Peter 3.18 says this, Grow in grace. I believe that we are to grow in our understanding and grow also in the, the experience of experiencing grace. So we're going to look at a couple of things. What grace is, what grace does. What grace is, I didn't give him a slide on this, but there's three words here. It's the unmerited, undeserved, unearned kindness and favor of God. And these three terms here are kind of like close, close cousins, so we're going to break it down a little bit. Unmerited just simply says that we're not qualified to receive grace. If there was an application for grace and you and I had to list our qualifications, we couldn't qualify for grace in and of ourselves and the goodness. Undeserved is that we weren't good enough to attain the grace of God. There's nothing that you and I have ever done or will ever do that, that deserves the grace of God. And unearned, there's nothing that we can, can, can do in our own strength in the sense of, of a, a task or, or meeting certain requirements 
that would that would give us something that we've earned. We couldn't pay for it enough. Unmerited, not qualified. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says this, and it's a familiar scripture here. For by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Let me tell you something. There'll be no boasting in heaven over the goodness of God and His grace. There's nothing in of myself that I can even boast on. Do you know that any good thing that you have, that you do, and the, any good thing that comes from you all came from Him? We first need to get a revelation that we can't boast in His goodness. It's all about Him. It's a gift, a gift of grace. You know, for it to be a gift of grace and for it to operate properly, there's a giver of a gift and there's a receiver of a gift. So Jesus is giving us the gift of grace. We need to receive the, the gift of grace. The first time we see Jesus, when we go to heaven, and if you're born again and you've received that saving grace, you and I will be there. It says, but it's the first time that we see Jesus and see the nail prints in his hands and the holes in his feet and the hole in his side, you're going to know and, and, and really get a revelation of the grace of God. It's unmerited. What's amazing is when we first got saved, we know we didn't merit it, but after sometimes a little while goes by and some years go by, and we maybe put together some, some good days or some good moments in God, sometimes we, we slip into a mindset or just an attitude sometimes that we deserve. I don't know about you, but it's easy to. We live, we live in a society now that is... Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, always feeling like you deserve, um, there's a word, entitlement. There it is. Thank you, Brother Kevin. Entitled. Let me tell you something. We weren't entitled to grace. We didn't deserve grace. It's undeserved. He showed us mercy and grace by making a way for us to come to him. And real quickly, mercy, the difference between mercy and grace. Grace is the undeserved favor that Jesus, he has given us. He has given us grace. We didn't deserve it. But how many of you know mercy too is that's the hand of the Lord that's holding back what we did deserve. Anybody in here just have the realization and the revelation that you and I deserved hell? Boy, it's getting quiet in here. While go away shouting and, and hooping and hollering. I know that don't sound like good news, that you and I deserve hell, but the mercy of the Lord held back what we deserved and what we've done in our sin. Anybody been a professional sinner before? You was really good at it before you came to the Lord? I'm serious. What did you deserve? But he has held back the mercy of the Lord. I was talking with somebody not too long ago, and I said, if I really stop and just take an inventory of my life, then there are times that I should not even be standing here physically. I should be six feet under the dirt. Several times. Much less that God has spared me and shown me his mercy, but then allowed me to minister and to, to worship him and to, to, to just love him on a stage or, or publicly. It's like he has shown me mercy. He has held back my, my just deserve. And then he's offered me the grace. He's given me something that I, that I didn't deserve. Number three, unearned. Romans eleven six, And if by grace, then it is no longer of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace, but it is of works. It is no longer grace let's substitute the words grace and work to free and earn bring a little clarity look at it this way that scripture says if it's free grace then it's not earned you're not in it, it's a gift of god we didn't earn it otherwise free is not free and if it's earned if we earned it then it's not free it's not a gift of grace otherwise earned is not earned it is a gift and it's already been paid for by Jesus, 
and it's given to you freely. Let me tell you something. I, it was just a little little phrase I kept hearing from the Lord. It said, amazing grace, how sweet, but not cheap. He paid a price for the gift of grace. I, I mean, I don't have to tell you. It's just it, it's shown in his son. He gave it all. We need to receive the gift of grace. Have you ever received a birthday gift or any kind of a gift and someone give you a gift and then you take it and receive it, but then that person says, okay, that'll be 50 bucks. So grace is unearned. It's free. It's the kindness and favor of God. It's what grace is. Free gift. He's already paid the price. We just have to receive the gift. What grace does, and this is where I want to spend a little bit more time this, this morning. And I promise not to hold you long. It's just, I want, this is where I believe the Lord downloaded some stuff in my spirit. So grace by the definition is what God has given to us. And we, we must receive the saving grace of God in order to receive eternal life. We have to receive. This isn't like you get to, maybe, maybe not like, this is eternal life. If you receive the gift of grace, salvation made through His Son, you will have eternal life in heaven. But the grace of God isn't just a one-time gift given for salvation. The grace of God can be active in your life right now. And this is where I want to emphasize some things today. Acts 4.33 says, And with great power the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Great grace was upon them all. Say that. Great grace was upon them all. And I believe that not only does God want to save us by His grace, but that He wants to put grace on us all, to apply grace. I believe that God wants to apply grace to, the, to your life, and not only your life, but your family's life. He wants to apply grace to our successes and our failures. But you say, I've made mistakes. I've, I've, I've made past mistakes. And how does that have anything to do with the grace of God in my past? Let me tell you that mistakes can be a setup for a miracle right now. How many of you know, but we've all, if you're living and breathing, you've probably made some bad decisions or wrong choices or mistakes. Anybody made some mistakes? Heaven wants to make you, and hell wants to break you. And here's a common ground is they both can use our mistakes to do it. Do you know that you haven't done anything too wrong, too, too, failed too much, that God can't turn it around and work it for His glory? Romans eight twenty eight. He's working all things out for our good. But hell would also, the enemy would also want to use your mistakes and to keep you bound up and, and destroy. The devil wants to mock you. He wants to destroy you for the rest of your life for the mistakes that you have made. But God can transform you through your mistakes into what he wants you to be. Mistakes should not maim us for the rest of our life. Mistakes, and this is, this is it, mistakes and failures. And the reason why I really want to emphasize this is because I believe, like we ta uh, said at the beginning, is, is Christians, believers, are still living bound up and living in bondage, living in prison and in shackles because of something that they've done in the past, something they're currently in the middle of that's anti-God. It's sin. Let's call it for what it is where we've missed the mark. But the Lord does not want to keep you there. He's offering grace. The enemy will love us all who have made mistakes to live and be held in bondage. Prison mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. Come on, how many of you know what I'm talking about? Sometimes 
we get caught up in, in a hiccup of something that we've, we've done or we've come up short. And I'm telling you, I've wrestled that thing in my mind, the what ifs, and what am I going to do, whatever. And, you know, God's not wringing his hands up there trying to figure out what he's going to do or, or how he's going to fix the situation. And it's got me so jacked up emotionally and spiritually because I can see the shortcoming. I can see where I've come up short. Grace is not a license to sin. However, I want to tell you that the great grace of God that we read about there in Acts 4 usually comes after a great mistake. The greater the mistake, the greater God's grace can show up in any one of us. Come on, do you believe that? But the enemy still wants to, he wants to capitalize on the shame and the condemnation. I think I told or gave this to Javi, put up point number one right here. You may have made a mistake, but you are not one. Come on, I'm going to say that again. You may have made a mistake, but you are not one. You've got to let that get deep down in your spirit and your soul, because when the enemy is beating your brains out and telling you that you're stupid, you're trash, you're no good for nothing... How could you be so dumb? How could you mess up so bad? And Satan wants to uh, apply the feeling of worthlessness to us. But that is totally the opposite of what God says about you and what God says about me. Do you know that he took it into account and he already knew before we made the mistake that we were going to make the mistake? Do you know that when he put his son on the cross... And he, get, do you, he knew good and well that from there until the eternity, after the cross, that we weren't going to be able to live up to perfection. That's why he brought grace. You may have made a mistake, but you are not one. You may have failed, but you're not a failure. You may have been knocked down, but down is not where you stay. God still has a plan, He has a purpose, and He still has a great thing that He wants to accomplish in your and my life. Come on, do you believe it? Let's get this in our spirit. Proverbs 24, 16 says that a righteous man may fall seven times, but he will get up again. Come on, it's not about the fall. And again, this does not grace, cheap grace, we're not preaching cheap, cheap grace to where this is just you go out and do what you want to. Actually, if you receive the grace of God and you get a revelation of how good God is and you receive, then it ought to make you, you don't have the attitude of I'm just going to go do what I want to. You have a, an attitude that, I, that I'm going to do my best, that I'm going to try. But if I do fall and I do make a mistake, I'm going to get back up with the grace of God, the help of the Lord. I'm not advocating to go out and make mistakes. But we would never discover how good the grace of God is unless we had went through some mistakes and went through some failures. Come on, if you're living a perfect life, and, and again, I, we strive. We, we strive to please the Heavenly Father. We strive to look like Christ more and more and more. But I'm going to tell you, sometimes it's in the failures in the bottom pit, the bottom of the pit where you and I have got ourselves in that we see how good God is. How many of you just got a revelation before that you shouldn't be where you're at right now? Absolutely. If it, not, if it had not been for the Lord, where would I be? God will never define you by your mistake. People will, your critics will, and your enemies for sure will. But your God will never define you even by the worst moment in your life. Isaiah 43, 25 says, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will remember your sins no more. Psalm 103, 12, a familiar scripture, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions, our sins, mistakes, failures from us. If you have received his saving grace, first of all, you are a precious child of God, child of the Most High God. Your daddy is the king. And right now, God knows everything about us. He knew everything about us when we were making the mistake. But he says, just give it to me. Repent 
and I blot it out and remember it no more. When you give it to him, he forgives it. Amen? It's the one thing that God can't do. I think that was a sermon. One thing that God can't do. He can't remember your sin once he's blotted it out. Is that good news? You and I dwell on it sometimes, and we see where, we've, where, we're, where we're coming up short, but I, I venture to say, if it's under the blood, and I've really put it under the blood, I go back and try to remind Jesus about it, and he's like, I don't even know what you're talking about. Is that good news? I'm telling you, the enemy wants to wear us out, and God wants to bring us out. When you give it to him, he forgives it. It's under the blood. He blots it out. He remembers it no more. He doesn't even bring it up the rest of your life. Now, some of us in here are good, especially if you have a spouse and somebody has come up short one way or the other. The where, and I'm speaking on my end. I dare not say that Michelle would do this, but I, I would. how many of you down the road you kind of tend to bring something up? Where they've come up short. Sister Barbara's shaking her head. Is she telling telling the truth? Or a friend? It's like we have we've been hurt, we've been wrong. Something's happened, and and we think we're over it. And then down the road, we bring it up. Let me tell you, good news, Jesus. He's never going to bring it up. So if I fall today, and I'm Lord knows I'm not I'm not trying to fall, but if I if I if I stub my toe today, and then I stub my toe three weeks from now, he's like, well, I knew he was going to do it because three weeks ago, he's never going to bring it up. The grace of God. Mistakes and failures, though, do have consequences. There's no doubt about it, but even there, they are mistakes and the failures, they do not define also your future in God. The devil wants to magnify your mistakes, but God wants to magnify himself through your mistake. Let me say that again, too. The devil wants to magnify your mistakes, but God wants to magnify himself through your mistakes. You see, in order for the Lord God to conform us into his image... Sometimes we're allowed to come to the end of ourselves and to, to make mistakes. We're going to turn this around. I know everybody's looking at me like, mistake, my word. But I, I bet this is a hitting home a little bit more than, than, than we're uh, shaking our head and amen it about. Because I'm telling you, we, we, get, we get so ridden down with the, with the enemy over where we come up short. We need, we need a revelation on the grace of God. We have to realize that we ain't going to be good enough. We're not going to perform enough to where we can attain it. It's already there for us. It's free for the taking. But in order to conform us, he lets us fail sometimes to come to the end of ourself and our own self-righteousness. Mom would say it like this. You, you got too big for your britches. Anybody been too big for your britches? You fill in your oats. That was another one. We have to come to ourselves, come to the end of ourselves, so we know and we realize how much we need Him and that we need His saving grace. Amen? If, you, if there's an ounce or an inkling of you involved, then you know what we're guilty about? Like something happens or good happens or, or you, you feel like you can pull yourself up out of a ditch, whatever, we start doing this. I, I did it. I got myself out. And Lord knows I've tried that before too. But the, the, the Lord will allow us to come to the end of ourselves. Why? Because He is working through us. He wants to magnify Himself with His grace in the midst of it all. Number two, your mistakes are not greater than God's grace. Do you know that God has already taken everything into account? He knew the choices we're going to make, good and bad. Nothing has ever caught him off guard. And if we know this and we understand this, 
then we've got to already believe that he already has grace that's way bigger than any blunder you're even going to make in the future. I don't plan to sin. And I'll say it again. This isn't a permission to sin. And we don't try to sin. But there's going to be times in the future from this point on that you're going to come up short. But let me tell you something. The grace of God covers a multitude of sins. His grace is great. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 says, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in your weakness. Remember, he's talking to Paul here. Paul was, you know, had a, a thorn in his side, flesh, where he felt like he couldn't get over something. He continually struggled. Have, how many of you felt that way? There's just some, one area in your, your life to where it feels like you just can't get over that, that hump. It's still attacking you. It's, it, it just nags and gnaws at you. But he says, my grace is... Is sufficient. It's enough. It's everything. It's all you need is my grace. And my power, the power of his grace, is made perfect in your weakness. Mind blowing. I don't have to have it all together. It's got to be in his strength, in his grace. Romans 5:20 says, Where sin abounds, my grace much more abounds. Where sin abounds, his grace much more abounds. I'll tell you how much greater God's grace is. He not only has grace for the mistakes, he has grace to also right the wrongs from our past. And in fact, he can rewrite your and my life history with his grace. Let me tell you some good news. Before we came to Christ, if you're born again in here, whether you were a good kid, bad kid, whether you had a good life, bad life, whatever, it starts right there. Your birthday in God, when, he, when you give it to Him and you receive his, his grace, His gift of eternal life, it's in the past. But like we were saying a while ago, there's consequences and there's percussions of things that we've done. Can we admit to that too? If I've already done some things, sometimes it'll catch up to you in the natural. But he has a way in his great grace to take those wrongs, to take those mistakes, to take those failures, and he can make them right. He can also rewrite. He can change the course of your and my, my future with his great grace. You're not stuck, and you're not, again, not to be redundant, you're not defined by what, what, we've, what we've done and where we've come up short. We're, we're defined by who he, says we, who he says we are. And he says, I'm a new creation in Christ. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. That means where, whatever course of destination that I was on, headed for hell, and then I receive his grace, he's rewriting my, my future. Come on, that's good news. It's, that's back to the mercy of God. Ephesians 1, 7 says, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. His grace can redeem what's been lost, and His grace can restore what's been taken. Have you had some things lost? Have you had some things where the the devil you felt robbed. He's taken some things. He's taken some people away from you. Too fast, too soon. Let me tell you, His grace can redeem it. I want you to turn over if you, if you, if you have your Bibles. This is where we're kind of land the plane here. Luke chapter 15. Very, very familiar passage. Luke 15, we'll be in, starting in verse 11.
Luke 15, 11. Then he said, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. Here we're talking about the story that we've talked about here in uh, your header in the Bible, what someone would say the parable of the lost son or the prodigal son. Well, we have a son that knows that he's got some stuff coming to him after his dad passes on his inheritance. And he goes to his father and he, sa he says, can I get it now? I want you to give it to me now. Mistake. Number one. But the father, he did it. He gave him his inheritance. And not many days, verse 13, and not many days after the younger son had gathered all together, he journeyed into a far country. Mistake number two. When we get too big for our britches, we start getting further away from the Father. When we, a sign of, of, of heading the wrong direction is, is getting a long way from the Father. It says, but there he wasted his possessions with prodigal living. Now, if you've seen this broke down or if you've seen it in the, the Jesus film, you'll see that, the, I mean, pretty much if you break down, it's just riotous living, partying it up. I'll let you, let you do the imagination. Anything and everything, just sinful living. He took everything and squandered it away. And sometimes I have felt like that to where I've seen the grace of God. And I've experienced the saving grace of God. And then I've failed. And I feel like I've squandered it, everything away. But he said he wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all there, when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in the land. It's just like we were talking about a while ago. He's, he's spent everything. He's wasted everything. He's made some bad decisions. And then the Lord lets him come to the end of it all. There's a famine that hits the land. There's nothing to even spend money. He don't, he's done spent all his money. There's no food. There's nothing where he is at. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. And he sent him into his fields to feed swine. How many of you have read this story before? So he's... He's, he's squandered everything, the famine comes, and, and then he's just looking for a way to earn ends meet or to eat, and he finds himself in the pig, pig pen. I'm going to tell you, that's where the enemy wants to get us, is the pig pen. And some of us have been there, and some of you, truthfully, could be there right now, and, and he's just got you bogged down over the mistakes that you've made. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine, that the pigs ate, because no one gave him anything. Resulted in eating with the pigs. But when he came to himself, but when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger? When he came to himself, how many know that's the grace of God? He's in a pig pen. And again, in and of himself, he probably can't, can't find a way out. He doesn't see a way out but God. He's saying, even the servants at my father's house, they eat better, they live better. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he's, he's already talked it up to himself. He said, I'm going to go back. I'm just going to talk to my dad. I'm going to you know, plead mercy. Just, I'll, I, I just want to be one of your servants. Just a place to, to lay my head, 
to get out of this famine, to get out of this mess I'm in, to get out of this pig pen that I'm in. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, the father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on him, fell on his neck and kissed him. Let's, let's, let's take that right there. When you are still a ways off, when you are still far off from God, but you've turned, the son has made a turn. He's came to the end of himself. This morning, I pray that if we're not, that we come to the end of ourselves. Because if we come to the end of ourselves and we just start making our way back to the Father, it says he didn't even make it all the way back to the Father, that the Father came and ran to him. How many of you would like or just need the Father to run to you this morning? You're a, you, you've been a long way off. Brother Will, could you come? You've been a long way off. But he's just... He just, we need to come, he's asking us to come to the end of ourselves that we, we turn to the Father and it says he ran and he had compassion. You know, again, it's the grace of God. He, he, didn't, he didn't run to the, the Father had every justification to get on to him. I told you this is what was going to happen. I knew it was going to happen. But he said he had great love and great compassion. The Father this morning has great love and compassion. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter, matter what choices you've made. He has compassion. And it says, he, his, he ran and fell on his neck and he kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned. Sinned against heaven and I've sinned in your sight and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and he's alive again. Come on. For some of us, we just need to be alive again. Some of us, we need to receive the saving grace of God, but some of us have been in the pig pen and we have felt so stomped down by the guilt and the shame. I know I'm talking to somebody in here where you've just felt like you've blown it and you hadn't found a way out. But he's just wanting you to turn to him this morning. He's going to come running to you. That's good news. He's coming running to you. Alive again. He was lost and he is found and they begin to marry and to, to party do you know that the Bible says that even when one lost soul one lost soul comes to him they're throwing a party in heaven let me tell you even if you've experienced the saving grace of God but you just need the regeneration the redemptive grace of God this morning, guess what? When we come back to Him, there's a party in heaven. Just like the Father there, He said He said he was lost, but now He's found. He was dead, but He's alive again. Come on, can we just give the Lord just praise? Thank you, Lord. Hopefully in some small way, the word of the Lord would, would go with you beyond this, this moment here of just the revelation of the grace of God this week that he would continue to reveal how good he is and how, how big his grace is and that he can apply it to any and every situation. Bless you in the name of Jesus. Have a good, good week in God. If you uh, can, volunteer for Summerfest. See me after. If you're a first-time guest, I'll be over here at the welcome area here in just a few minutes. But just blessings in Jesus' name. Have a good week.